Welcome back to Wake Up with Nubian Tigers Talk, a podcast brought to you by a group of Black Princetonians. In our podcast, we talk about real issues impacting our Black communities. My name is Michelle Jacobs, and as always, I'm here with my co-host, Ray Smalls. So, Ray, back again, and what's been going on? I don't know, <laughs> but, but let's start with uh, what's been going on with the hearings uh, regarding January 6th, where white folks went nuts at the Capitol, and uh, the general of the National Guard for, the, uh, for DC uh, said that um, there was a little bit of a delay <laughs> <laughs> and getting the National Guard deployed. I mean, a what? three hour delay. <laughs> you know, and, and and here it is. You know, he testified, but he didn't have any people that he was, you know, talking to, that he was uh, conferring with uh, on the dais at that point. That those generals and people from the army are going to come in a separate uh, hearing. But that was mind blowing. Three hours. Well, the thing I loved about his testimony that is was that when they questioned him, he pulled out the memo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where um, the Pentagon had limited his ability on January fifth. Right. To take any kind of a rapid response to what was happening on January sixth. So that was fascinating. I don't know where that's going to go eventually, but it's sure looking like uh, some Trump appointees were involved. In and that. the big thing that they kept saying to him was optics. We're concerned with the optics. Right, right. So there was one good question. I forgot which senator asked it, but uh, it was sort of directed towards we're concerned with the optics when the protesters are going to be white, but we weren't concerned with the optics when the protesters yep. were black. So that that was an interesting. Well, thing. and not only that. Now, I, I mean, if you remember when Trump and and Barr cleared the the area uh, outside of the White House so he can go and hold up the Bible that he never ever held in his hand before. It was upside down. <laughs> they had, I mean, they had a whole half a block full of horses, mounted horses, right. you know, cops on horses. And then behind them were a, another layer of cops that had the riot shields. And so it's, they didn't even have horses when they were the, when right. they had this event at the Capitol. Well, we don't want white people to feel like they're... <laughs> to be assaulted by the police, right? We have to worry about those optics. And hey, Dr. Seuss got woke. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I grew up on Dr. Seuss. Who and, didn't, right? And, well, yeah, yeah, but I just remember being a kid, like I couldn't wait for those little brown packages with each new book to come in, you know, because that's how I was learning to read. You know, my mom had that, hold on, uh, had a subscription and everything. So I couldn't wait every week for a new book. Yeah, but I think that's great that the publishers on their own, uh, in recognition of the changing times, decided mm -hmm. that some of the stuff, we, we all love Dr. Seuss, yep. but some of the language that was used yes. in those earlier books would be yes. inappropriate. Yes. Um, in an environment today. And to their credit, um, they decided that they would no longer push those books. So, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know why the Republicans are calling it cancel culture. It's the publisher who made the decision <laughs> and nobody forced them to do it. And I think it's just a wonderful mm -hmm. modeling mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what a business can do if they really are sensitive to the issue of uh, structural inequalities and uh, racism in, in, in America. The so. quote from Dr. Seuss Enterprises was, these books portray people in ways that are hurtful and wrong. Right. So I think that's great. Um, now, on the other hand, the senators who voted to overturn state elections were voted against a bill this week to yes. protect state elections. How about that? <laughs> Talking about the federal government shouldn't be involved in state elections. And yet yep. two months ago, they were trying to overturn state elections. So that's pretty yep. interesting. I, I don't know. I, I think this is where Democrats constantly drop the ball. OK, they do not campaign hard enough for state offices in the House and the Senate. And because of that, there is a, a, they are run by just a bunch of MAGA hat wearing Trump, Trumpists that, you know, when you start to look at the number of, 
of voting rights bills that they are putting together. It's like over 250 uh, bills that are there to suppress the vote. Well, you know, as voters, we have to stay aware of that and alert to it. And every state in every state, voters have to pay attention, particularly now, to what is going on with legislation regarding clamping down on people's rights to vote. So hopefully we'll all stay aware of that. Yeah. Now, speaking of uh, things that are going on down at the Capitol, uh, as you know, there was some action taken on the president's uh, $1.9 trillion COVID stimulus Thank relief God. bill. Thank God. Yeah, finally, right? Mm -hmm. So it's now gone to the Senate uh, for them to discuss and debate, and hopefully we'll see some action coming out of the Senate before we die. But <laughs> today... <laughs> <laughs> but today, we're talking with Linda Darrow Chapman, one of our own Nubian Tigers. She's going to help walk us through the COVID stimulus relief bill that is being debated in Congress. Linda's from the Princeton class of 75. After Princeton, she obtained her MBA from the Wharton School of Business. She has over 40 years of financial and operations experience in both the private and public sector. Welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So today we're going to be talking about President Biden's $1.9 trillion uh, COVID re stimulus relief bill. Um, he proposed it to help people still struggling from the pandemic and to help the economy rebound from fiscal problems caused by the pandemic-related shutdowns. The House of Representatives recently passed its version of the bill. Can you walk us through the bill and what's in it? Okay. So um, you may have mentioned that the bill um, as, as proposed um, by the House is $1.9 trillion. It contains several um, provisions. I'll, I'll go through the major ones with you. The first um, that, that gets a lot of public attention because it touches the public is the stimulus checks of $1,400 per eligible individual. And um, you may have heard earlier this week, there's been some relatively minor concessions that have been made by the Biden administration and by the Senate um, with regard to the cap for the individuals who will receive those checks. But, but that's the biggest chunk of the bill is the $1,400 stimulus checks. A second major component is the unemployment um, enhancement of unemployment benefits. This is another case where just earlier today, we learned about a concession that's been made, a relatively minor concession where these unemployment benefits is an enhancement above what a state gives an unemployed individual. The original proposal by the House was $400 enhancement um, per week. That's been changed as of earlier today to $300. Um, but on the other side of that concession is originally the House proposed that the unemployment expansion would go through September. It's now been proposed that it's going to go through early October. So there's little concessions going on to us to, I believe, um, meet the demands of moderate Democrats, but um, that's the second major component. Another major component is a significant amount of money that's going to state and local um, in, in municipalities, including tribal and territorial governments. Um, in this case, what's very significant about what Biden has proposed and what the House has um, put in the legislation is that the funding is unrestricted. So in 2020, throughout all of the stimulus packages that took place during the, once the pandemic began, a lot of the state and local funding was restricted. The states were told how that money could be spent and it was primarily for pandemic related spending. In this instance, the state and localities can use that money to fund if they wanted to, they could use it to pay down debt. And that's very controversial with the Republicans, but that's what's in the proposal now. We're waiting to see, obviously, if that gets through the Senate. Another major component is um, a big chunk of money that's going through K through 12 schools, as well as colleges. Um, colleges, schools have incurred tremendous costs in, in trying to reopen the schools, and um, certainly lost revenue on the part of colleges with regard to enrollment. And so this will in part make up some of that difference. Another obviously major component is um, funding that's needed for COVID vaccines, 
testing, contract tracing, and a number of other health services that's, that's in the bill. There's also small business assistance, as well as agricultural and nutritional assistance. And, you know, I won't go through the exhaustive list, but in addition, there is significant funding for um, scientific research. When you hear about the variants, who's paying for that testing, as well as international and humani humanitarian responses. So that's a pretty simple summary of um, what's in the bill as it stands right now. Hey, one of those concessions is pretty interesting, and I was going to get to this with you later, but I'll just raise it now. Um, you said that the restrictions were lifted from how the state uh, and local municipalities can spend the money. Um, one of the things I've heard people complaining about is that the previous stimulus uh, relief bill money wasn't spent. And in looking through that, I see that a lot of states, including New Jersey, some of uh, New York, have complained that the restrictions were so uh, tight on how they could spend the money and the rules were ever changing that they didn't get a chance to really spend the money at the time that they needed it because, because of all the restrictions that were in place. So it's good to hear that. Um, He's lifted the restrictions. Yeah, that's And it. in fact, it was not, you know, this was kind of invisible because it happened during the holiday season. But in late December, Congress did extend that 2020 money for the state and localities until the end of 2021. Okay, so um, the restrictions associated with that money has been extended. So it does allow the state and municipalities to now go back and have some time to say, okay, how do I meet the requirements of that particular legislation? Okay, because some of that unspent money still has the restricted rules to it. But Biden's new money gets added on top of that, and it doesn't have the restrictions. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And it's, it's yeah. helpful, right? Because one of the things that I found was interesting that uh, a lot of the money that had not been spent had been targeted for daycare centers mm -hmm. and child care service providers. Mm -hmm. And they were not able to get access to the money because exactly. of some of the restrictions that were in place. And guess that's who exactly that hurts the right. most? Right, and of course that's gonna hurt black women and other women of color because they mm -hmm. are the essential workers who need the child care services. Right. So, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. another small example, not to extend this, but I thought this was interesting. In the previous legislation under the Trump administration, um, Washington DC was considered a territory and therefore did not receive a big enough chunk of the money set aside for state and municipalities. And this new legislation with Biden, DC is gonna be get the same formula as any other state mm -hmm. and therefore is entitled to, it's something like 700 additional, $700 million. No, because, that's all important. I mean, the, the because DC is not a state, we are impacted at that level by the federal government. We didn't get uh, the initial round of COVID vaccines, DC got 7,000 shots. Yeah. Unbelievable. With because a population of state. seven or 800,000 700, right. Well, right. and let's face it, DC is also impacted by who's running things, whether it's Republicans or Democrats. That's true. So, that's true. That's, that's, why exactly we need, that's why we need to be a state. That's why we need to be a state. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That'll be another show. <laughs> where, where, where's George Clinton in Chocolate City when we need him? <laughs> All right. Well, when the bill was initially being proposed and people were sort of freaking out about the price tag, Janet Yellen, who, as uh, we all know, was confirmed to be Secretary of the Treasury, advised the government not to be afraid of the price tag. And she said, now is the time to go bold. So what was she meaning by that? Yes, she is very bullish with regard to putting money into the economy. And she's known um, um, for her um, the best term is the Keynesian theory. So that says that when a recession occurs um, and that the private sector starts contracting with regard to the money that's in the economy, it, in her opinion, every dollar of contraction should be government spending, putting it into the economy. She believes there's evidence that says um, that it's the best thing to do. Her number one goal when she speaks about being bullish and putting money into the economy and that the price tag of this American rescue plan is, is, is sufficient. Her number one goal is to get unemployment down. So you don't hear her speak 
Not that she doesn't care about the stock market, but you don't hear her speak about that being a primary goal as in the previous administration. Her goal is job growth. If right now unemployment is at the 10% level, which means 16 million or more Americans don't have a job, she wants to get, her goal is that with this additional spending, economic growth will occur, people will be employed, and her measure for success is having the, the unemployment number back to pre-pandemic levels, somewhere in that neighborhood of three and a half percent. So she wants to go from a 10% high of unemployment down to three and a half percent. And she also wants to do this by keeping interest rates really low. So, um, it, it, and, and that's part of this inflationary talk that you might hear some Republicans speak to when they say, you throw all this money into the economy, it's gonna lead to inflationary pressures. So her goal is, is job growth. So, so, so under that theory, if there's job growth, it wouldn't actually increase inflation. Is that right? That's, Am I understanding that right? That is correct. Okay, so just, just a quick um, understanding of inflation. So you put a lot of money into the economy, you put a lot of money in the hands of Americans, how do we spend it? So let's use a manufacturing plant that can produce three cars. And now because you have so much money, um, some, some would say that five people wanna buy those three cars and it's gonna to lead to the price of those cars going up. Okay, she will say, no, I'm going to increase, but the economic growth will increase the amount of cars that can be manufactured, and therefore inflation's not going to be a factor. Okay, she's basing that on history. So, you know, go back to the 2008 recession, a ton of money was put into the economy. Mm -hmm. And in, in general, economists believe that inflationary pressures did not occur. Okay, that, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, and so her, I, I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Just going back to that, um, how did uh, now since you know Miss Miss Yellen has all that experience with with the Fed, what was her understanding of inflation and how the Fed can actually offset or have inflation you know remain low so that prices aren't going up for everyone? They do it with monetary policy, and they and one of her goals is maintaining very low interest rates. Now, one of the things that is an outstanding question is, because interest rates are very low, but there's a motivation for interest rates to be low. And that motivation is US debt. So to the extent that the, the, the US is only spending, I mean, I've heard rates half of a percent on treasury bills. That obviously allows you know, low cost borrowing to fund all of this stimulus. Because you think about it, when Joe Biden says, I want a $1.9 trillion stimulus plan, he's not financing that through, um, through tax revenue. He's financing that with debt. So it's in the US interest, it's in the Fed's interest and Janet Yellen as, as Treasury Secretary, it's in all everybody's interest to keep interest rates very low. It doesn't necessarily help savers, but it certainly helps the federal government. So, um Linda, according to reports, 41% of black businesses across this country, they've been forced to close uh, due to the uh, pandemic. Will the funds um, in this bill help them to reopen or will it only help keep the remaining black businesses that are still open functioning? Okay, so there is definitely eligible, eligibility criteria in Biden's bill. But if that business, so I'm gonna give you an example of some of the eligibility requirements. If that business was in operation prior to January 31 of 2020, so we're talking 14 months ago, if that business was in operation prior to then, they are eligible for all of this funding that is in the administration's bill. Um, a, a couple of other eligibility requirements includes if the business suffered a 30% reduction in receipts, gross receipts, just think of it as sales revenue, in the period of time, in any eight week period of time between March 2020 and December of 2020, if they can prove that, an eight week period of time in, it, in which they suffered a contraction of 30% or more, they become eligible. So the House legislation, proposed legislation that's now sitting with the, um, the Senate 
has a lot of money associated with small businesses. And some of it is targeted toward Biden's goal of funding for Black-owned businesses, Latina-owned businesses, Asian-owned businesses, Native American-owned businesses, as well as women-owned businesses. There's specific legislation that addresses minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses, um, one of which includes a $15 billion grant money, okay? Hmm. Okay, there's, I'm gonna, it's a pretty lengthy list, but there's a lot of what I call free money in the administration bill. What? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Michelle, did you hear that? Free money? Free money. If you qualify, again, Ray. <laughs> if you <Okay>. qualify. <laughs> start, start with, are you eligible? Okay. <laughs> that first eligibility was you have to be in operation prior to January 2020. That second eligibility was you had to have that eight week decline at any period between March and December. Another eligibility is you have to be, and there's a definition for this, located in a low income community. So you can't be sitting up in um, Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills <laughs> and be eligible for this money. Right. So okay. Gucci so, on Rodeo Drive, they can't get no money. <laughs> they can't get this money. There is money for Gucci. Right. right. There is okay. money for white businesses, but there's specific money that's targeted for minority owned and women owned businesses. Right. One of which is $15 billion in grant money. Okay. There's a provision for 25 billion just for restaurants and bars, mm -hmm. okay? Because there's a recognition of, if you think back to the PPP, which some might classify as a disaster for small businesses, in terms of the PPP was, was supposed to be for, specifically for reducing job losses, okay? But when you look at what occurred last year, after when the, once the pandemic began, 46% of restaurants and retail jobs were lost, mm -hmm. but only 16% of those businesses got PPP loans. I mean, this, the gap there is outrageous. Yeah, and I read that the Small Business Administration was giving PPP money to P uh, Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Exactly. And Shake Shack, you know, that hit the papers. When Did, Shake and weren't they, weren't they so embarrassed by it that they gave the money back? Some of them did, yeah, but some not of them, all them did, did, but not Ruth Chris Steakhouse did not give their money back. Right. Um, and I saw that um, the black and other folks of color who had small businesses were having difficulty getting that PPP money because right. the SBA was giving the money to the people that they already had established relationships with. Correct. And when the banks got into it, the banks gave money to the people that they had established relationships right. with. So these little small uh, black and brown businesses were being squeezed out mm -hmm. of the market. Um, and then there was something exactly. called the Community Fund Investment. Um, uh, it's some kind of nonprofit group that, can, that in the second round of PPP got money that they could give to the small businesses. But then of course, it was less money, <laughs> right? And I think I saw one stat where they got a thousand applications but could only give 200 uh, right, loans. Right. And the other problem I think they said was that many black and brown small businesses don't have employees. <laughs> it's basically them and their family members trying to keep right. the business alive. And so they didn't qualify for that. Do, do we know yet who's going to be doling out the, the money? Well, the SBA is definitely still part of it. However, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. With that $25 billion that's allocated for restaurants and bars, because of what occurred last year, which was a nightmare for small businesses, they couldn't even get into the door. Apparently, there's a three-week period before those white businesses can apply for a piece of the money. So it's first targeted for minority-owned and, and women-owned. Yes. We know there's an issue there. Right, right, okay? right. But, you know, so black businesses have a window, right? I mean, they, they have, have a, a three-week window. Right. They gave them 21 days. Great. So the biggest concern that I have is awareness. And they have to know that now. They have to be on top of this legislation now. Because the advantages that a Ruth Chris has or a Shake Shack is that they've got accountants and lawyers who have people in offices studying these things and can pick up the phone and call them. But our little restaurant and bars on our neighborhood corners don't necessarily know so the biggest issue is awareness. There's a lot of free money in the Biden 
Okay, you have to be eligible. You have to prove. Right, right. No, we get you. Okay. <laughs> you can't okay. just uh, be living on the corner and go, go get some right. free money. Right. <laughs> right. There's also um, there's also 175 billion of loans, but the loans are at interest rates that are less than one percent. So that's better than they can do at a commercial bank. So there's money there. Um, I also found it interesting because this was proposed by the new senator from Georgia, Warnock, where there's money for minority farm owners, free, here right. we go, free grant money, up to $100,000. Right, okay. so that's all part of um, a longstanding problem that the Black farmers have had with the United States right. government. Right. There's a piece of uh, litigation that's uh, still trying to work out the settlement of that. And hopefully in a future show <laughs> that won't be coming in too long, we are, we're gonna be looking specifically at uh, the financial crisis right. that black farmers- uh, Along with the piece of legislation excellent. that Cory Booker yeah. has proposed as well. Yeah, that's but I excellent. saw that um, somebody on the Senate committee had actually complimented Warnock for the fact that he brought the issue to the table and was persuasive in uh, educating them about the needs of the black farmers. And it's to me, that was just so, so much an indicator of why we need representation Thank you. for our issues, not Thank you. just Absolutely. the general issues, because we have issues that the general public is not experiencing. Mm -hmm. And if it hadn't been for Warnock being present, right and able to participate in that conversation, the black farmers wouldn't have been part of that bill. Yep. That's yep. absolutely correct. Agreed. So that's very significant. There's one other component, so you can see there's a long laundry list for small business. There's one other component called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, E-I-D-L, which provides up to $10,000. If you meet the criteria, it's not a loan, it becomes a grant. So there's five different components that can address small business needs. So here's where um, I'm, I'm troubled. Let's say we are in communities where, especially rural communities, where cable, uh, internet is, it's not available or it's, you know, it's intermittent or what have you. Um, other communities where, uh, you know, folks aren't just up on things because they're just not fully functioning or aware, like they get their information from maybe the churches or what have you, or community centers if they, if they have them. If the government isn't making overtures to these places to try to uh, make people aware of what's available to them, how do they get to these black and brown communities across this country? That's a great question, Ray. I, I mean, what, what I read in, as I was reading through the proposals to date was the frustration of knowing how do the businesses know. The biggest thing that happened, remember with the PPP money was $500 billion, half a trillion dollars. And we were hearing in like a four week period, it, all the money was gone. And the money was gone by corporations that didn't need it. And they played games. Uh, there was, a, there was a, um, a ceiling associated with the number of employees you could have. But if you were a franchise, like a Ruth Chris's, or a right. Shake Shack, all of a sudden you, you met the criteria. But we know that's not the intent of that legislation. So it is frustrating. I don't have an easy answer to your question about communication and knowledge. They have to know that this is out there. There's a, they have to know. How do, you, how do you educate them? Yeah, you know, the problem with the SBA is that they have a longstanding history <laughs> of being accused of, um, ignoring the needs of, of black businesses. So, um. One of the things that Janet Yellen has, uh, in fact, this was just in this week's news, where she's setting up through the treasury an enhancement of funding that goes to minority, institu minority banking institutions. So that there's not many of them, but that is one way in which a small business, if they have a of a relationship with their minority bank can learn about these types of programs. Mm. Yeah, they should do it, it um, like the medical offices are doing, you know, send out a message to your patients. Hey, we're going to have a COVID vaccine available mm -hmm. in 
X amount of weeks, why don't you just go ahead and register? Mm-hmm. And when we get it, we'll let you know. So it would be wonderful if um, point. there could be some kind of setup like that right. so that businesses could register or at least be, at least register for notice, right? Even if they can't pre-register for the benefits. So That's a great point. Yeah, I hope people are thinking about those issues. Sometimes uh, right. Ray and I find out uh, in the show that there are so many things that need to be worked on, you know, and it's one of those situations. It's very frustrating, but it's also um, an example of why everyone has to pick the area that they think they can be most effective in and do the work in that area. So that if we have a thousand people, we could theoretically have a thousand areas where people are working on and getting information out instead of everybody focusing it all in on the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so Linda, as you've been reading through the materials, are there, uh, let me let me use this word, are there any legitimate concerns that people might have about the, the size of the spending that are, that we're being asked to support? Um, in my mind, no, because of the hardship that occurred last year. Okay, and, and when I hear the opposition talk about it's, it's too much money, um, the first thing you think of is lives were lost, jobs were lost. There's a lot of people, when we speak about 16 million people, and that 16 million, by the way, is people who are collecting unemployment as well as people who have given up on finding a job. Remember, if you look at the paper, they'll tell you that the unemployment rate is 6.3%. Right. But Janet right. Yellen and Jerome Powell say, no, 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 no. It's closer to the 10% level right. because of the number of people that have given up. There's been so much hardship out there mm-hmm. that, that the funding that we're talking about is truly needed. So I don't know, we're gonna talk a little bit about low income families because something as simple as the child tax credit is very mm-hmm. significant. So one of the things mm-hmm. you're hearing Biden talk about is he's going to reduce the number of children in poverty with this bill. And you think, well, how's he going to do that? Well, he's put in a provision that I'm sure some Republicans say it's not necessary that says, even if you have very low income and pay very little in taxes, if you have children, you will get a credit. So let's say you only pay $1,000 in taxes, but right now, currently, there's a $2,000 tax credit. Biden's proposal increases that to $3,000 for children between the ages of 6 and 17 Mm -hmm. and $3,600 for children under the age of 6. They they don't quite know how they're going to administer it, but they'd like to administer it not as a lump sum, but through monthly checks or direct deposits going into these low income families account. That is very, very significant. That's how he's raising people, raising children out of poverty with an additional, if you're under the age of six, $300 a month. So of course the Republicans have said that if you do that, it would be a disincentive for yes. people right. to work. Right. So right. they right. won't work and earn a wage that's sufficient to support their family because they'll live right. off of the $300 a month, which is not sufficient to support right. their family. Even though there are no <laughs> jobs out there for them to get any right. anyway. But, but you know, um, there was an interesting uh, report that came out just this week. Uh, some of you may know that this, the mayor in Stockton, California, uh, is a very young brother, and he took over as mayor when Stockton was on the verge of declaring bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the the mayor has been truly innovative in thinking about how to raise his city up out of poverty. And one of the things they decided to do was they fundraised to get a pool of money to send a select number of citizens who met, you know, their poverty. Uh, requirements. $500 a month. It's unrestricted, no questions asked, and you get it for a period of two years. So they've just released the results of that first two-year program. Mm -hmm. And what the results tell us is that the people use the money to pay down debt, to stabilize their family environment so that they could get work, 
Mm -hmm. and that they went out and got work and almost all of them are fully employed now based on excellent? being able to secure their families right. with this unrestricted $500 right. a month. So rental assistance, home ownership. Assistance. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, when right. you can pay your rent, when you can put food on the table, right. these are the things that allow a family to go forward securely. Right. So it'll be interesting to see if that portion of the bill survives. Uh, I do know the Republicans are already resisting that. Um, but it seems that there's a moment in time, we're in a right. moment in time right. where things mm -hmm. that are truly innovative right. can at least be tried to see if they would work. The bill also includes, I mean, think about the number of women who have not been able to stay in the workforce because schools closed or they couldn't get childcare because of the pandemic. Right. The bill also includes, at a certain income level, well, low income level, a reimbursement of 50% of your child care costs. Okay? It's, it's very significant for a low income family. There's no question about it. It will be interesting to see if it survives. So with all of this, uh, uh, I, I want to go back to when you were actually just talking about just the entire tranche of money, that $1.9 trillion. And correct me if I'm wrong, but people in the Biden administration said, we're not going to make the same mistake that the Obama administration made back in 2008 and 2009 when they were trying to get their stimulus passed. So what are they going to, what, what are they doing, Linda, to be able to, uh, to not let the bill get whittled down by Republicans, which is what they did in, in 2009? Well, the single biggest thing they did in terms of um, making a decision was that they didn't necessarily need, if they can retain the 50 Democratic senators that are, are, are in Congress now, they, they did not necessarily need um, Republicans. They would like Republicans to vote for this bill, to vote positively for this bill. I find the concessions that have been made this week very interesting because that says to me, he's, they're trying to hold on to Democrats. Right, those little concessions that were made this week is an indication they're trying to just hold on to their fifty. Don't, don't get me started on Joe Manchin, please. Don't don't get me started on him. Okay. It is unbelievable how quickly we can anoint someone a kingmaker, or he anointed himself a kingmaker. But irregardless, so in my mind, the biggest thing that we heard in terms of not making the same mistakes the Obama administration made was to to just need be able to do this through that so-called budget reconciliation process, to not need 60 votes in the Senate. Right, you know, right now we're even hearing the possibility of doing an infrastructure bill using that same process. But regardless, I mean, what Obama tried to do the right thing, right? He, he tried to work with Republicans and at the end of the day, he found out, oh my gosh, I gave them time, I gave them voice. And at the end of the day, they didn't come over. So well, he uh, sort of had the blinders on because he might have been trying to work with them, but they clearly they knew, weren't yeah. trying to work with him. Yeah. And they said that. Yeah. <laughs> so they did say that. Yeah, they very said that. It wasn't a surprise. So listen, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, one term president, right? Yeah. Who yeah. said one -term that? One term president. Yeah. McConnell, right? McConnell. Yeah. That's all his focus was. Right. And so now what you hear is because Obama only got roughly, the number started out slightly under 800,000 by the time a few um, billion, 800, yeah, 800 billion dollars. The bottom line is that it's generally believed that they did not achieve the job growth that was anticipated with the mm -hmm. Obama stimulus. Mm -hmm. It took six years. Right. It wasn't until 2014. Right that they were able to say, okay, we've, we've gotten all the jobs back from the 2008 recession. Right. And so that's why Biden's saying, we're not making that same mistake again. Right. We're going big, we're going yep. bold now. And yep. we're gonna do it under a process where I, I would like Republicans to come on board, but I don't need them. Yeah, that, that begs a very complicated analysis of whether Biden's white privilege allows him to step out bold that way in a way that uh, perhaps Obama didn't now, you know, I'm, it's no secret, I'm not 100% a fan of Obama's <laughs> policies, but I do think in that context, he may not have had the freedom or no. he may not have felt he had no. the power no. to right. do what, no. Oba what Biden will be able to do yeah. simply because he's yeah. white. I'm Time waiting, will tell. Time I'm will tell. for the public Time option. I think that we're going to get a public option uh, in the ACA before Biden is done. Uh, yeah. because 
because I think they'll give him give it to him rather than give it to Obama. Right. It's possible. I mean, that's that's a part of the analysis wow. that you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everybody has to be real yep. about that. There, yeah. there are other things that we can legitimately criticize Obama for. And if you give me an opportunity at some later point, I'll do that. <laughs> <It's not today. laughs> but, um, this ain't that show. No, this is not that show. But <laughs> on the economics of it, I do believe that race played a great role in what he was not not able, able to, to do. do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Linda, this has been a fascinating discussion. So yep. let me ask you, is there any last words you wanted to, did we not hit something that you felt needed to be said? You know, um, one of the things that does not get talked about a lot in the news, but it's, we all recognize what's going on. When it comes to hardship, Native Americans have experienced in this pandemic, it's just been incredible. So mm -hmm. in terms of they are dying at twice the rate of white Americans, there's right. no question about that. And so um, the Biden administration has sp specifically put in funding for um, tribal governments, federally recognized tribal gov governments. It's up to $20 billion to assist with healthcare services and um, vaccine rollout. And we didn't talk about that, but I think it's equally important. Yeah, no, it's critical. for sure, for sure. It's critical. Um, been ignored. Of all of the folks of color, they have uh, died at the highest rates yep. from COVID. And that's not something that we hear about too much in the press, but I know tribal elders have been wiped out mm -hmm. um, and there's uh, lots of tragedy and catastrophe happening uh, on the reservation. Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad to see that. Um, they're included more they're included. substantially. Well, and it would be nice if, you know, they would get some of these kinds of medical facilities actually built closer to the reservation. Some right. folks have had to be carried like an hour away just to get medical treatment uh, during COVID. It's, right, it's, right. it's incredible. Right. And, and yet another show, and yet another show. <laughs> that we hope to get to uh, one day. <laughs> so th Linda, thank you so much. Thanks, you know, Linda. Uh, oh, you know, we, we love you anyway, because you're a member of the group. And, Absolutely. Uh, we've just uh, been in survival mode for the past week, but a uh, year, but uh, we've been wanting you to come on the show. I'm glad that uh, I've been able to. This is very expertise. important legislation and we'll see yes. what occurs. Yep. Yes, we'll Fantastic. keep an eye on it and I'm sure you'll keep us all informed about what we need to look at next. Okay. I will do so. Thank so you. So thank you very, very much thank you, uh, for being on the show. Thank you. And since our recording of this episode with Linda Darrell Chapman, the Senate has finally passed President Biden's $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, otherwise known as the American Rescue Plan. And now it's on to the House for the finishing touches before it finally gets to President Biden's desk for the final signature and enactment into law. And uh, Michelle, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our next episode, which is going to be about Ayers Property, based on uh, an article that uh, you hit me to that came out in ProPublica in 2019. Right. So we're going to be talking to Dr. Sandra Thompson from uh, FAMU on the heirs property issue. And hopefully we'll all be learning something about that. Absolutely. If you enjoyed what you heard today, visit our website, NubianTigersPodcast.com. In addition to the podcast, we also post a resource page for each subject to provide additional sources of information. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Nubian Tigers, written as one word. We're on YouTube on the Nubian Tigers podcast channel. Have a favorite podcast service? Well, we're probably on it. So just subscribe and look for us under Nubian Tigers Talk. Looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you next time. Wake up, wake up, wake up.